On June the 12th, Ontario voters sent nearly 20 new members to the provincial legislature. And no doubt the questions began. What day does caucus meet? Do I meet constituents in the riding office or at Queen's Park? And hey, where are those bathrooms anyway? <laughs> Joining us now to tell us what it's like to be a newbie at the Ontario legislature, we welcome these newly minted rookie MPPs in alphabetical order. Granville Anderson, he is the MPP for Durham. Jennifer French, MPP for Oshawa. Sophie Koala, MPP for Kingston and the Islands. Eleanor McMahon, MPP for Burlington. Indira Naidu Harris, MPP for Halton. And Diane Verniel, MPP for Kitchener Centre. Always last. <laughs> always last. I'm always That's last. what happens when your name starts with a V. <laughs> and listen, as long as we're on it, Diane, what is the, because I know when we bring the super up and, and show what your first name is, everybody's going to think we misspelled it. So let's do that right now. Can we bring the uh, super for Diane's name up, please? There it is right there. What's the story on that first well, name? First of all, let me apologize for the spelling. This is my Italian mother. This is how she thinks Diane is supposed to be spelled. Uh -huh. So if you sound it out as an Italian, what it's Diana. Got it. So there you go. And what's the Italian pronunciation on the last name? Vernile. So I should have said <laughs> Vernile. I'm Multiple. coming back in my next life as Mary Smith, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming to Side and having this little get-together uh, so we can find out a little bit more about what it's like to be a rookie of the Ontario legislature. And I want to start with you because, full disclosure, you and I have known each other a long time. Yeah. We go way back. Mm -hmm. And you called me many, many months ago. Did. And what did you ask? Steve, I said, I'm thinking of running for the provincial liberals. And what did I say? You're crazy. <laughs> well, I, 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 now, in, in, fairness, in fairness, I didn't say you were crazy until you told me what riding you wanted no, to run in. No, that's right. To be fair, I did yeah. say, implicit in that, was that I was running in Burlington. And you said, you're crazy. Couldn't they perhaps find you another safer seat? Uh, because yes. when was the last time a liberal had won Burlington? 71 years. So yeah, no, I wasn't yeah. completely ridiculous to suggest no, no. that. No, you weren't, absolutely not. And with your knowledge of history and, and knowledge of the arena, certainly you weren't off base, but uh, I guess the people of Burlington made a different decision. And why did you decide to seek a riding that had not been Liberal in 71 years? I guess I didn't give that much thought. Uh, over the past couple of elections in Burlington, certainly, the uh, share of the popular vote had been much more progressive than it had been Conservative. And we just decided to change the conversation and I think give people the permission to vote a different way. Uh, because there was this, this uh, sort of prevalence that Burlington was a Tory stronghold. And well, it was. Point, it certainly was. But in point of fact, again, between us and the NDP last time, we outpaced the progressive conservative vote by 7,000. So what I wanted to do was to say to those fakes, hey, maybe you can think about voting liberal this time. I think we gave them a reason. And I guess the results played that out. Gotcha. Granville, when was the last time your seat went liberal? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, it's 71 years as well, <laughs> since 1943. 71 years? Yeah. So why would you want to run in a seat that, by all rights, you had no chance to win? You know, that's a good question. I personally felt I had a chance to win it. I'm c confident that way. And it, I started out having my doubts about that. and. Saying I'm a masochist, but <laughs> 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 but as the, as the campaign progressed, that quickly changed, and I had a lot a lot of young, vibrant young people on board, and they helped me and they energized me and helped change the channel, as Eleanor said. And mm -hmm. from there, it was all fun and games. Fun and <laughs> games. The last few it? weeks, you know, as it progressed, it felt better and better and better, and I felt very confident toward the, towards the end. And I'm, I'm thankful to the people of Durham for taking a chance and changing mm -hmm. political stripes. They did indeed. Jennifer, you can't say that it's been 71 years no, since Oshawa was NDP, but it had been almost 20. Yes. And when did you get your nomination to run? One week, or excuse me, one month before uh, the election. So May. Yes. May of this year, May 12th. you got nominated, mm -hmm. and then a month later, you got elected. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a fairly short span of time. So <laughs> a, a lot of people who got nominated a year earlier and campaigned for a year hate you right now. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> if that's the only reason they have, I'll take it. So we're good. <laughs> Why, uh, okay, so you're, you're from education, right? You were a teacher? Yes. Why did you decide to run? Um, well, coming from public education and being part of that, system and being part of different communities and seeing 
um, some of the realities that families and communities are facing and, and some of the challenges within the system, um, I tend to I, sent, I tend to notice problems and I tend to see those challenges and um, they say the cracks are how the light gets in to something and I decided to, actually I just got really frustrated, you know, um, navigating a system that had challenges and I wanted to be in a position to um, address some of them and maybe, maybe even fix them one day. So that's kind of took me out of the comfort of a classroom. Well, I don't know if you can say the comfort of a classroom but uh, to switch gears and um, reach out on a, a wider scale. If you want to see discomfort, just wait. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, wait till I'm, question period. Well, I'm, uh, well, we've been we've been in question yeah. period, and I've I've, uh, I've had a taste of it, and I I'm hoping that my teacher instinct won't come out, and I you know clap once if you can hear my voice, you know, in the middle of question <laughs> period, and bring them all back to some semblance of behavior. Gotcha, Sophie. Why did you decide to run? Well, I had been working for seven years in the federal constituency office, first for Peter Milliken and then for Ted Hsu as his chief of staff, and I, I knew what it was to provide good service, good public service to constituents. I was concerned, uh, as many of us probably are, about uh, constituents in the riding and, and what we feel that they need. And I felt that I had the ability, uh, our office had a very good reputation, I had the ability to deliver that good service, so that's why I decided to run. Gotcha. Indira, second time for you, right? Yes. You yeah. ran last time? Yes, I did. Two elections ago. How close did you get then? I lost by less than 2% of the overall vote. So you decided to give it a second shot? I did. Some people came to me and they said, we think you should do it again. And uh, my family said the same thing. So I knew I had the support I needed. And uh, I have to be honest with you, at first I thought, do I really want to do this again? Mm -hmm. Because campaigns are a lot of work. But uh, after giving it some thought and realizing how close we had come, and I really believed that Halton should be read. And I wanted to be that change and make sure that the ha that happened. So, here we are. What made you think that the second time around it would be any different a result than the first time around? Well, we had come close, but the second time around, I, uh, I, I frankly, I didn't stop working. So that was 2011, and once I made the decision that I wanted another shot at it, I looked at what I needed to do, and basically it was grassroots work, right? Knocking on doors, going to every single event I could go to, making sure that I talked to all my neighbors and friends, and making sure that people in town knew that it was me, and in the riding knew that it was me that was running. First time around, I think people weren't so sure who that hyphenated last name was, some people recognized me from my days as a journalist, others didn't. At TVO? At TVO, at CBC. And other places CTV. too. Yes, but yes, you and I worked together. It was amazing. Back in the day. Back in the day, <laughs> that's right. So um, this time around, just worked solidly and hard and, uh, you know, with a little bit of hope and a dream and believing in yourself and believing in the support that we had in our premier, uh, it all worked out. Senora Vernile. Si. You also are an ex-journalist. Why would you want to leave the glories of journalism for the misery of politics? And it was a one-way journey because I knew that when I was headed in that direction, I was pulling the plug and I could not go back. Once you declare that you are a political candidate, you've shown the world you have political stripes, you cannot go back to being a journalist, and that's that. Uh, but for me, it started with a phone call on a Monday morning from a liberal strategist. And I actually thought he was calling to complain about an interview that had just aired the night before on Province Y to show that I produced and anchored for 29 years at CTV Kitchener. This interview with the Premier and I thought he was going to say, why are you so mean, why are you so aggressive? Because I would get calls like that from time to time. Um, but that's not why he was calling. He was letting me know that they were looking for candidates in Kitchener-Waterloo and he let me know off the record that John Malloy, the longtime MPP, liberal MPP for Kitchener Centre, was not going to be running again. And they needed someone new and he said, your name came right to the top of the list. And so I said, well, that's not why I thought you were calling. He said, well, listen, at least you need to sit down and talk with us, talk to the Premier, and it's not an interview where you come with a TV camera, <laughs> talk to her about running and leadership and other issues. So I did that meeting, um, and I have to say that working in the industry for 36 years, and I'm an old cynical reporter, and I, I just have not been inspired by anything in a long time. After that chat with her, I went home and my husband said, what do you think? And I said, you know what, John? I think I'm going to do this. I was inspired by Kathleen Wynne. The next question then becomes, I think John Malloy won that riding by, was it 50 votes? Uh, just over 300, 300, but it was tight. Okay, it was really close, which meant that 
and he, he'd, of course, been there before. So you're coming in as a rookie, uh, although with high name recognition because of what you did for a living. Uh, was there any thought that, um, hmm, this is going to be too tight, and I don't know if I can win this? It was really, again, because of Kathleen Wynne, that chat that I had with her, and I looked at who she was, her ideas, and her integrity, and I stacked that up against the other parties, and I thought, I don't think we can lose this. We're going to win this. I guess at this moment I should say there are no Conservatives at this table for an obvious reason. The Conservatives did not elect any new MPPs last time. So in case anybody at home is watching wondering, how come no Tories on this show? That's why. I want to take you back to the 12th of June. Election night. Did you know you were going to win, Indira, on election night? Did you I, know? I actually had, I had no idea. You didn't and, know. And so what I was election night like? I had a team like? uh, that made sure that I was kept away from the television sets and everything else. But I told my team going into this that I didn't want to know what the polls were saying. Why not? So I actually, because I, I felt that polls uh, take, basically they take temperatures at different times during the course of a campaign and so on. They're not completely <coughs> predictable about what will happen. And I didn't want that to influence how I felt about what was happening and what was happening on the ground. So every day I went out and just did my best and I would tell them not to tell me what was going on. And the day of the election, no clue, no idea, uh, went out for dinner uh, somewhere outside of the riding so we wouldn't hear anything, came back in, and uh, I did not know until I walked into uh, my office uh, what, what was going on. Talk about a flair for the dramatic. You really you didn't, <laughs> didn't sneak a peek at any of the returns? No, I didn't. And so, you know, moments before we walked in, we did a family hug, my husband and two kids, and. Uh, uh, you know, probably the hardest thing for me, Steve, was that uh, on some level I remember thinking, I ran in 2011, I came close and I didn't win. What am I saying to my children tonight if I have thrown everything at it and you tell your children you, you know, you have a, a strong belief system, you work hard, or, you know, strong work ethic and all these things, and what happens after all of this if I walk in and I don't win? You know, what have I taught them? And the answer I came up with was essentially, I would have taught them how to lose gracefully. Turns out you didn't need to worry about that. No. Mm -hmm. Election night for you, what'd you do? I stayed at home. <laughs> I didn't watch television. My children, they were at the campaign office. I just didn't want to know. <laughs> okay. I, so I, I got to tell you, I <laughs> totally don't get this, anybody. <laughs> this makes no sense. You, you put it your was, heart and soul into something for such a long time, and then the yeah. moment of truth comes, and you're home hiding in the bedroom? And it, <laughs> it, it, was, it was one of those things. I, and I've run as trustee for on three occasions before. First time I won my 12 votes. So it, it was so nerve-wracking and tense that I decided I didn't want to go through that again, so I just decided to stay home. So how'd you so find about out that you won? <laughs> about 10 o'clock I changed, and I went to the campaign office, and... Mine was one of those that was so close it wasn't declared, so I waited and we were, I was in the lead by maybe a thousand votes and it, it kept steady at that and I think it went up to about 1400 and it looked good then and I still wasn't sure, I had to pinch myself <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I wondered is this really, wait until the little, you know, the little tick. <laughs> <laughs> then I felt good then, and it, it was all wonderful, and it, it was, wasn't for me, I was still, I was surreal, and it, for me it wasn't, the camp, my campaign staff, they were more exuberant than I was, I was kind of, it still hadn't sunk in yet, and I was mm -hmm. there, and they were all excited, and they were wondering why I wasn't, and it, it, <laughs> it, it was just something special, and it was special for them. And it was special for all the people who have tried before me for 70-something years. So it was more their victory they were hmm. than myself. Jennifer, I think yours was the only seat that the NDP took away from the Conservatives. It was. In the whole province of Ontario. Yes. What was election night like for you? Well, election day was interesting because I was... Um, I was, <laughs> I was out in the community and I, I spent a lot of time in, in the neighborhoods that I had been canvassing a lot um, and was pulling the vote on that day and, and really visible in the communities and knocking on doors and I was working and it was a hot day. And um, anyway, I was oblivious to what was happening um, 
I went home and I changed and I was getting phone calls from the campaign team saying, Jen, where are you? Um, you know, because everyone had been at, at the, uh, well, what turned out to be the victory party. Mm -hmm. And then we had the group who was counting everything and as the polls were being phoned in, were keeping track in the campaign office. So I got there and had a friend trying to do my hair as I'm trying to pay attention to what was <laughs> happening. And I got a phone call saying, congratulations. I said, what are you talking about? And you've been, CBC declared you the winner. What? Let go of the hair. You know? <laughs> um, because the, the calls were still coming into the office and, um, you know, and, and it was, it was pretty exciting to be in that room and hear the level of enthusiasm because, you know, as they were saying that there were polls that we had well, no business winning or historically hadn't. And uh, so that was, that was pretty exciting. So you didn't think you were going to win? Well, it wasn't about not thinking I was going to win. It was just all day. I had no idea what was happening in other, um, you know, in, in other polling stations in other neighborhoods. And then when we got over to the uh, victory celebration, it was it was awesome. My dad was there. My grandma was there. I had no idea she'd be there. She had no idea that I, you know, was anything but a teacher. Um, <laughs> and uh, bagpipes, and it was it was really a fun celebration. It was an awesome. Uh, room to walk into and and that was when I started to see hey I'm on TV you can see down in the bottom bar and I realized that I've been missing this you know all evening yeah. but uh, anyway you have gone to presumably many victory parties over the years for other politicians what's it like to go to your own it was an unbelievable experience I uh, all throughout the campaign I found myself being quite separated from the political and the campaigning aspect of it uh, in the beginning, my kids asked me what it was like to see my name on signs all over the city, and I found myself being very separated by it. I, I just, I almost felt like it was happening to somebody else, uh, which was a very strange experience to go through throughout the whole campaign. So on election day itself, I, I uh, went to one of my daughter's uh, school award ceremonies. And uh, afterwards, I, I just went home, no radio, no TV, and uh, I, I just all... I totally don't <laughs> get this. All, I just don't get I that. I know. It's, it's, really, it's really odd. But all throughout the campaign, I was the same. And as we were driving at about 10 after 9 to the place of the victory party, one of my girls was in the back seat and said, oh, mom, some guy from CBC said that you won, and I said, well, that's ridiculous. How can he possibly say that? It's too early. And she said, well, I don't know. Don't ask me, usual teenager style. That's what they said. And I said, well, you know, I think we'll wait until we see some numbers. So we got to the, the Victory Party Hotel. I had a room there, and I was with some of my family in the room. And, uh, and we were seeing the, the uh, display on the screen. The one on the bottom had all of the candidates and some numbers, so I was focusing on that. And one of, one of the uh, campaign helpers told me, he said, Sophie, if you see held beside your name, it means you got it, okay? And I, I said, okay. So he went out of the room, and he, he and I saw that come up on the screen, and, and, and I thought, well, that's ridiculous. It can't be, so I'm gonna wait until I see it come on the bottom of the screen. So he came back into the room, and I said, Paul, I think, I think I saw held beside my name, but it was going by so fast, I wasn't sure if it was for me or the person before. And he said, what? You won! You won! And he was screaming up and down, and, uh, and that's when it dawned on me. <coughs> that's when it dawned on me. Okay. <laughs> Tell me you were at least not closed up in a, oh my in a closet <laughs> without oh, access. Well, to, I mean, you know you, how shy I am, so yeah. I was all by myself, so being you, quiet, of course. You, but, uh, you were at a polling station checking? No, I no? was, like most of my colleagues, I was out in the community during the day. I had to stay busy. Right, because I, you know, sitting alone somewhere, you know, just tapping my fingers is not my idea of a good time, <laughs> and uh, I wanted the time to pass quickly. So I was out in the community pulling the vote, and then I went and had some quiet time with my family. And uh, but we did have the TVs on and the radio on, and uh, of course I had my phone. I was looking at Twitter occasionally. And uh, did you think you were going to win? No. I didn't. I mean, think I was going to win. I, a bit like Indira was saying about polls and so on, you, you tend to, your gut is, I think, a gr really great indicator. I think everybody would probably agree that that's true. And what you're hearing from people at the door is the, is the greatest indicator, I think. And I started to think a couple of days before the election that, 
wow, uh, we can make a breakthrough here as people started talking to me at the door. And that's a great thing about canvassing, right? It's instant, it's instantaneous. There's no filter there. People will tell you exactly what they really? think. Really? <laughs> people tell you really? Good and bad, they do. It's, uh, oh, indeed they do. They don't sugarcoat do. it. They no. don't tell you what you want to hear. No. And uh, sometimes older folks are a little bit more private about their intention to vote. But, but generally speaking, I, I, you know, people are quite clear about how they're voting. And as it got towards the end and got closer to election day, there was greater clarity. And so a couple of days before the polls, I thought, geez, I think we could make a difference here. But I, I certainly wasn't thinking, gee, I'm going to win this thing. I Would knew it was going to be by? close. About 3,500 votes. Yeah. And, uh, That's quite a swing. It, well, yes, indeed. I mean, it was uh, really quite mm -hmm. remarkable. I'm still pinching myself. I, I'm sure that everybody could, could, could agree with that. I mean, I was, I was on election night, and I still am. Election night for you, Diane? Well, um, I'm going to tell you about election day first, and they get, get mm -hmm. to the night. So they assigned John Malloy to me to keep me from going squirrely, and we were getting the vote out. <laughs> He's the guy you were replacing, yes. the former yes. member. So we went door to door, and we had some long chats, and he was trying to prepare me for what comes next, uh, win or lose. Um, in the evening, uh, I wanted to pull away and go have dinner with my family. He said, no, let's keep knocking on doors right up until 9 o'clock at night. Then just go home and spin around in the shower for two minutes and then go to your party. And I said, John, I'm an older lady. Like, I don't just spin around in the shower for two minutes. There's, there's hairspray and eyeliner involved and whatnot. Anyway, got home around 7.30. My daughter, Claire, made a lovely dinner with uh, two older brothers, Curtis and uh, Andrew. We all had dinner with my husband, John. And then I went off to get myself prepared. The best part was having the TV on and they were channel surfing and whenever it came to Kitchener Center, nobody dared pronounce my name. They were <laughs> talking about the opponents and saying who they were but avoiding saying my name for fear of mispronouncing it. But it had us ahead. And then at one point they all started whooping and hollering and I think this is right when I was squeezing into the Spanx and I came running out of the bedroom and, and they were jumping for joy and my husband came up to me and said, uh, congratulations Madam MPP and gave me a big hug and I knew we'd won. Went to the party and uh, I wish I could go back and relive that night because it went by so quickly and like you said, Sophie, it's like you're having an out of body experience. I want to go back to that night and actually enjoy it and pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sadly for all of you, you're never going to have another night like that for the rest of your lives because there's a, only a first yeah. That's victory night once. I do want to find out about the first week on the job. And Jennifer, I'll start with you because okay. Indira, you'd run before, you've been around politics. Uh, worked for other politicians, yes. so you have some sense about what it's what it's like. Sophie, obviously, same case for you. Eleanor, mm -hmm. working for John Chrétien, mm -hmm. John Turner, mm -hmm. long association in politics. You have some. You, you've never worked for a politician before. No. You've never run before. No. You probably didn't even like politics before. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's try and sort of understand. You're a real newbie. First week at Queens Park. What's it like? Well, um, it's been awesome. Uh, one of the first experiences, and I got a story for you, um, and we were all there, it was at uh, New MPP Orientation, and you get lots of great information, and mm -hmm. some of it's practical, and some of it's, you know, historical, but you learn about the building, and you learn about the hauntings, or you learn about the history, and anyway, and then we were, I would say we were all a little tentative, yeah. you know, and still getting, finding our feet, mm -hmm. and maybe we hadn't all introduced ourselves, and we were walking down the hall, and there were two women quietly walking along the hall beside us in period dress and they were quiet and I looked at them and I looked at the other MPPs and I said can anyone else see them <laughs> <laughs> and we looked and then they sort of looked anyway we kept walking and there was a, a green room and it was a day that they were filming actually uh, Murdoch Mysteries for their episode that was interestingly enough uh, this <laughs> so yes it wasn't haunted that day but anyway um, the Murdoch Mysteries episode I think is it, it uh, focuses on uh, picketing and, and rallying for women's suffrage and mm -hmm. so as being um, the first MPP, the first female MPP from Oshawa, um, but also the f you know, member of the first majority female caucus, that's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. So what's interesting that's is you. watching... Just, we shouldn't let that pass so yes. quickly because no. people might not know this. <laughs> Yours is mm -hmm. the first majority female wow. MPP caucus ever in yes. Ontario history. Which is 11 exciting. women, 10 men. Mm -hmm. And the woman, uh, of course, a female leader as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's. Uh, it, it's 
no small thing to be a part of. And, and um, you know, walking through the halls and seeing where all of the names are inscribed in the marble and, and knowing that our names will be up there, it's pretty exciting. You can find Agnes McPhail and you can find Ray Lecoq and, it's, and you think, hey, my name's going to be up there too. It's a remarkable place to be. Uh, you know, when you, when you drive up towards Queen's Park and you look at it every day, it doesn't ever Mm -mm. lose any of that excitement, yeah. you know, and, and that this is where you work on behalf of so many people who put you there. It is, um, it's very humbling, but it is, uh, it is awesome in the truest sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And Dira, what's the difference between going into that chamber as somebody's executive assistant and giving briefing notes and dealing with them that way, to walking into that chamber with a pin on your lapel that says you're a new MPP? You know, it was, um, a really huge difference for me and I think you know this a little bit about me Steve from our conversations before but I, I was born in Durban South Africa so my family you know I was born under apartheid and most of my family uh, you know live much of their lives if not all of their lives never ever having uh, been a part of a democratic system let alone being able to have a voice or be able to vote so for me, even though I'd worked for members in the past, to actually be in that chamber, sitting in there, which is awesome and very awe-inspiring, mm -hmm. uh, the, the privilege and the honor and the uh, notion that uh, this is such a momentous occasion on so many different levels for me personally and my family, but also you know, for the people and the voters of Halton to be able to represent them there. You, you cannot walk into that chamber without feeling mm -hmm. like you have to give it your best shot. You have to make a difference and you have to really be there and listen to the people who elected you to get there and, and be their voice. And we, that's extremely important to me. We will find out how you intend to do that in just a few moments. How steep, Granville, the learning curve for you? To expound on what Jennifer said, it has been a very humbling experience. Indeed, it has. I, I didn't thought it would be that humbling because, I, as I said, I've been elected as a trustee and I, I knew a few of the members around that, that, like being a trustee, I had worked with the Minister of Education, for instance, and I was a riding president, so I have had fundraisers with a number of ministers came to. And the premier came out to visit one of my schools a few months early, yes, and she's a wonderful lady. And that's one of the reasons why I run. She has such conviction and such a belief in helping people. So it has been, and just the bill in itself, it's, I've been in there before, but it took on a whole new meaning, a whole new dimension. So yes, it has been quite an experience and You've been in the building before, so you didn't Many know where times, the bathrooms yeah, but, yeah, were. Because I, I have had, you know, I've had new members tell me, you know, you know, it took me six months to find out where know, the bathrooms were. I didn't really know where they were, but I found them quickly, and I, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still, I still don't know a lot about the building yet. I tend to get lost sometimes. It's, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot I'm not of nooks the and one, unless I have a real bad sense of direction. But <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor, I want to ask you a similar question to Indira because, again, you've worked for a lot of mm -hmm. politicians in your day, uh, mm -hmm. but then you, you took your seat on the floor. Wow. What was that moment like? Well, to build on what uh, Granville was saying, I think you know you can work for other people, and you you uh, sort of realize those, you've been in the House of Commons, you've seen it and so on, but then your name is on the lawn sign and <laughs> it's actually you and uh, you, you do, uh, it's incredibly, uh, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, for me, uh, because the riding had been progressive conservative for 71 years, um, I feel the burden of people's expectations. And, and part of that is my own desire to do well. And I think you've heard around the table today that these people and, and all of the 17 new members that are there and all of the rest of our colleagues are there because in their own way they want to contribute to the quality of life for the people in their community. And that's why we're there. And so as long as you don't forget that, I think you'll do well and as you can serve your constituents. So it's extremely humbling. And when you have people come into your office relying on you to help them, and you feel as though you've taken their issues and their problems in your hands and they've asked you to help. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more gratifying to have the opportunity to help people every single day. 
And sometimes I wish that people saw that more mm -hmm. often. Sometimes politicians have a difficult um, reputation. And some of that, to be fair, is deserved. But what I see of the people that I've had the privilege of working for, you mentioned a few of them, Herb Gray, of course, uh, included in that bunch, are dedicated Canadians who want to dedicate service and time to their community. And it just doesn't get any better. How great is that, really, to have that opportunity to help people and change their lives? It's awesome. Diane, I want to ask you, because you're another one of these uh, ex-journalist types who probably spent 30 years, you know, if not actively disliking politicians, certainly learning to <laughs> have a healthy skepticism for what they do for a living and maybe getting a little chippy and in their face from time to time. And now you're one of them. Does that feel odd? Well, over the years, and you know this, there are some politicians that make your skin crawl and other ones that you have a tremendous... Name names. Well, Name names. Let's after, compare. Afterward, over some beers. Uh. But then there are those that you walk away and you think, you know, they answer the questions and I think they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, for me, going into the legislature, I looked at, what is my job here? Well, the good people of Kitchener Centre elected me to be here. I'm here to promote their causes and to help them. And um, I look at what it is that I'm doing every day and compare it to being a journalist. Now, as a reporter, you are there to put the spotlight on people and their issues and injustices and try to make the world a better place. You're there to help people. What do politicians do? We're supposed to do the same thing, only through different means. Our job is to try to bring laws and policies into place to bring dignity to people's lives. And that's what I hope to do. Speaking of dignity, uh, this will be the one time in our chat here where I want you to look at the monitors in the studio because, Sheldon, if you would, there was a very dignified service at Queen's Park quite recently. We had a new lieutenant governor sworn in. Jennifer French, do you recognize that picture? Uh, uh, I'm, yes. I'm busting you here, Jennifer. <laughs> as far as I know, you're not really allowed to take pictures okay. from the floor of the legislature. However. But, but you snapped one there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that's and, just uh, on the right okay. of the shot. That's Andrea Horvath's profile on the right of the it shot. It is. And in the upper left, you can see you. Oh, can you? Yes, I never you can. Oh, that's, that's why. Right. That's why I took it and I sent never, it to you. I never noticed that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for throwing anyway. me under the bus. However, <laughs> for special occasions, there are because this is allowed, and there were a number of guests sitting on the floor, which normally also isn't allowed. But right. of course, you know, uh, distinguished guests, and they were also taking photos. So I thought, well. If, Why not? if no one will say something to that guy, they won't say anything to me. Snap. <laughs> huh. Nice view, though. It, it was. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Okay, I want to shift the discussion a little bit here to, you mentioned going door to door before and that mm -hmm. people are very candid with you when they go door to door. Mm -hmm. And this is a lovely moment and you're reminiscing about what a great first week you had on the job and how wonderful election night was and so on. But there are people watching our broadcast tonight who are, with good reason, incredibly cynical about what all of you people now do for a living. Mm -hmm. They don't like, maybe not you personally, but politicians in general. Mm -hmm. They think your motives are, um, you know, misplaced. They think you're all out there to sort of curry favor and burnish your own credentials and do whatever it takes to get reelected and that you haven't got your eye on the prize, which is them. And I would like to know, Sophie, why don't we start with you? Is there anything you think you can do over the next four years to ameliorate the public's view of politics and politicians? Absolutely. I think that uh, the message that came to me all throughout the campaign was whatever you do, just keep being yourself and keep being honest and don't change. Can and you I, do that in politics? Yes, you can. Because I don't have to tell you, there's lots of people who are going to say, yeah. Sophie, we remember you when, but then you yeah. get in there and you get whipped to vote a certain way and the Premier's office tells you to do this, that yeah. and the other thing yeah. and whatever happened to you. Are yeah. you worried about that? No, I'm not. Why not? Because I've been, I've been sitting in, in the three weeks that we had after the election was called. We've had a number of caucus meetings. I've had the opportunity to come forward and express constituents' concerns that have been contrary to what the party is, uh, is working towards. And I have to say that uh, my, my bringing those concerns forward was always dealt with with the greatest respect. This is, in, in my mind, an, a government that is very open to uh, looking at really 
solidly working for the people and making a positive difference in people's lives. Indira, I would like you, I know you're not supposed to do this, but <laughs> just among us kids here, the first caucus meeting. Yes. Caucus, of course, is confidential, but I'm sure Premier Wynne got up and gave a speech in caucus to welcome all of you new Liberal MPPs. Right. What'd she say? You can tell us. What did she say? <laughs> you know, um, what she said was just uh, how thrilled she was to have us all there and what a great team we are, that she'd been talking to many of us and also talking to people who know us. And uh, that What'd she say about staying there? What it would take to get you to not only win this one time, but actually come back? I frankly don't remember her talking about that. I think she talked more about uh, the caliber of the people at the table, what we were there to do, which is a job, which is to serve the people of Ontario, uh, to work together and with all the various parties that were sitting at the table, and that she felt uh, really thrilled and honored to have uh, such a great table of people that she would be working to with. She also said that her door was always open, and to not think for a minute that uh, you know she would not be interested in hearing our thoughts on various things and uh, encouraged us to be ourselves and to speak up when we felt the need. That's what I remember from that conversation and it was, um, you know, it, it was really a, a wonderful experience. If I can just add something, Steve, you talked about the fact that there's a certain attitude out there at times about politicians and this is something I tried to address at the door every time I knocked on it when it would come up. Um, you know, having lived in other places and been under other systems, I can't tell you how uh, important I feel it is that we recognize and give our politicians respect because I think that if we live in a society where we don't value the people who we, who we have elected as leaders we are not going to necessarily attract the caliber of people we should I, I be. I totally get that and I'm with you uh, most of the way on that but yeah. sometimes not the people at this table of course mm -hmm. but others behave very badly there, I, and it's hard to have respect for people who behave very badly you watch question period people, my goodness gracious there are people in my neighborhood in my town <coughs> in my community in my riding who behave not properly at times mm -hmm. however that does not mean that I don't have a belief in the people around me or that there are good people out there or that we should all be working towards the common cause of creating a society that is good for all of us. And I think you have to have that faith and have that faith in people in order to ensure that we create a society that reflects who we are. What did Andrew Horvath say in your first caucus meeting about how to do the job properly, what not to do, all of that kind of stuff? I don't remember a, a how-to. Um, that wasn't a part of it. It was, you know, I think the customary welcome, but also it was recognizing um, that we have 21 people around that table uh, who bring huge talent and strength, and it's going to be, especially with some of, you know, new members and figuring out how we all fit together as a caucus, um, to spend the time, uh, you know, obviously the dynamics have changed with, you know, the Liberal majority. A lot more, <laughs> um, a lot more of them than you well, know. Well, this is true. Um, but it's about our, well, as it always has been, it's about our constituencies. It's about our communities. Um, so that's a big part of it, too, is, is making sure that we are really connecting in our communities and, and uh, working as a team um, to bring those voices. And um, actually, the question that you had asked, um, you know, about what, what can we do in four years? Mm. Um, one of the things that's so exciting about the individuals coming through the door in such need yeah. and coming through the door in our constituency offices, um, we have a chance to connect with community organizations and individuals in, in the next four years. And we've already been in Oshawa having some of those uh, roundtable discussions with different groups who all have a similar need or purpose or goal and introducing them to each other and, and creating things locally that are going to be able to sustain themselves and maybe find that momentum that well, I'm living proof that uh, there are no guarantees in politics, but in four years that those, um, that those new programs or systems or initiatives can continue on. And I think that communities need to see in their elected leaders that authenticity and, and sincerity of purpose um, and recognizing that, yes, Oshawa has its, um, has its own needs that might be uh, peculiar to Oshawa, but more often they're, they're needs that are typical across the province, and so bringing those voices with us to Queen's Park and, and finding that common ground and advancing, you know, bringing the voices that otherwise right. wouldn't be in that room. Uh, I'd like to hear you, Eleanor, because you've spent so much time working for other people in public life, you've been around it for a while, I want to know if you've thought about how to get 
some of the rancor and the hate and the cynicism and all of that out of politics and what you think you can do over the next four years about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I The saddest conversations at the door for me were people who said, because of their rancor and their disappointment and their um, cynicism, were not voting. And those were the, I just find that incredibly sad when people feel so disengaged from the public process. I think some people choose to be disengaged. I think it's our job to engage them, but some people, Steve, just really aren't interested. And that's, that's incredibly unfortunate because as someone who likes to work very collaboratively with others and tries to engage people and try to appeal to them in a certain way, which by the way, I think is um, my colleagues in caucus would agree is the premier style. She's someone who sets the tone and, and works with others and is a collaborator and, and really tries to find common ground and works very, very hard to do that. And I think if we do that in our own way, and if I do that, and if I demonstrate to the people of Burlington that despite their political affiliation, um, you know, uh, even if they didn't vote for me, I'm still their MPP. And uh, I think you sort of have to kill people with kindness, Steve, to be brutally honest, <laughs> and just take the high ground and stay positive and demonstrate another way of thinking and doing to people. And I think if you stick on that ground and you stay positive and you work hard, I don't think you can lose. Diane, I want to find out, because your party won a majority government with less than 40% of the votes, uh, you got a majority government because of the way the votes split, but that's hardly uh, the majority of the votes. It's hardly an overwhelming mandate. I'd like to know what you, if anything, have plans to do to reach out to the opposition parties so that um, it doesn't look too dictatorial in that house. Well, with the majority, of course, we, uh, we do have the mandate to govern and to move forward with our ideas. And I think that when you take a look at that budget that was introduced initially in April and then reintroduced in July, and go through it, many people were calling it an NDP-friendly budget. So there are many initiatives there that would appeal to the other political parties. But um, in terms of how we get business done, what you tune into every day, Monday through Thursday, from 10.30 to 11.30 is all that yelling and question period. Mm -hmm. What you don't see is the committee work, and that's where the real work gets done. So on those committees, um, some of them have been struck, and they're working now. Let's get into the fall and see what happens, see how we work on those committees. Grandlin, I think people will cooperate. Have you thought about how you, over the next four years, can take some of the partisan rancor out of this job? Yeah, I, it's unfortunate. For me, personally, it's, the election is over. I represent all the people. And my staff, they know that. I made that abundantly clear. When you say that, you mean you represent people who also didn't vote for That's you. That's right. And you intend major, to serve them as well. And you correctly said the majority didn't. Mm -hmm. But I serve everyone is treated equally with dignity and respect and their problems are addressed equally. So it's it, it's I know the cynicism is out there but you know what politicians by and large work very hard. I work 7 days per week and it's a myth that, oh, it's a, it's a luxurious job, you do nothing. I, I can attest to that. And I'm sure my colleagues work just as hard at it. And I'm not complaining. It's something I enjoy doing. I enjoy making a difference for a use of a better metaphor. It, but, you know, I enjoy helping people. And if you help one or two or three, I get satisfaction, derive personal satisfaction out of that. So. It's a job and I'm there for the people hmm. and it's all the people. So that's really well, I think I Sophie things. I think people expect a certain amount of partisanship in politics. After all, you all run on different banners. But they don't like mindless partisanship. They don't like stupidly mindless partisanship. Uh, have you thought about how you can take some of that out of politics over the next four years? I have, and uh, I think that that stems from my, my background, and I have to also back up uh, what Eleanor is saying, that we need to kill them with kindness. And the, the other thing... But, but ultimately, at the end of the day, kill them. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't well, notice that. Yeah. <laughs> gently, gently, gently. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. But the other thing, it, the one thing that I found quite intriguing about day one in the chamber was my first reaction to what was going on in between our side and the opposition side was was horrendous to sit there and listen to and feel and tell us more specifically what 
the heckling? Well, I'm not, I'm not somebody who likes confrontation. I'm somebody who has worked from behind the scenes for a long time to support the federal member. And so when you're all of a sudden in the position where it's you that this is being directed at, that, that takes something completely different. And I was surprised and very proud that our government, that the Liberal Party, was not throwing back the barbs in the same manner that they were being delivered. They, I felt that they were very respectful. I felt that Kathleen Wynne was very respectful and that the tone, even although we had a, a clear majority of the votes that were cast, the tone was very respectful, and I I was very proud about that. Uh, okay, I should ask the uh, opposition member here. Be killed with kindness. Do you uh, do you heckle? Mm. Um, <laughs> I haven't had real opportunity yet, <laughs> and I am really hoping that I will not. Because um, you, as a former teacher, I would think would understand the yeah. need for well, some decorum. decorum. Well, some, some decorum. Some. Well, this is yeah. what I was saying: is I'm yeah. hoping that I don't bust out a you know, clap once if you can hear my voice, or you know, <laughs> hands on top. That means stop or something you know, with the misbehaving. But um, I, I'll be having my uh, former grade sevens now, grade eights. They'll be coming to visit at some point in the fall. And I warn them. Well, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to sort of beginning as I introduce them to remind them that everything that they've heard all the way along about eyes on the speaker and don't interrupt and wait your turn yeah. that it still holds true true in real life, just not in the legislative chamber. <laughs> However, um, you know, I, I'm going to be careful not to say that all heckling is bad or is you know it's because not. it, it becomes part of the. Um, it's not, a, it's not great, and some of it really crosses the line, but uh, when you do sit there and you hear different spins or different takes on, on a situation, mm -hmm. It is very difficult to now, sit there quietly and behave yourself. Now, while However, you have the floor well. here, you, you, you are a new rookie MPP, and as a result, you have sort of been dumped into the middle of a bit of an internecine brouhaha within your own party. Right, because so I've read in the paper. Well, then it's got to be true. Uh, <laughs> that there, you know, outside the city of Toronto, the NDP did really well. They won mm -hmm. a lot of, they won some seats that they didn't have before. They won some seats by massive margins that didn't happen before. Mm -hmm. But of course, in the city of Toronto, you lost a couple of seats yeah. and nearly lost a third. Uh, your leader is going to be reviewed. Her leadership is going to be reviewed mm -hmm. next month at a convention. Yep. How are you voting at that? How am I voting at yeah. that? Enthusiastically. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm looking forward for, to the... For or against the leader? I beg your pardon? I'm just asking. Have you... Oh, good question. Um, absolutely for, and I support, uh, I support Andrea, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens at convention because what's fun about that is it's going to be, you know, new Democratic Party. We're not... Democracy is not the new part, you know? Um, and to be at that convention with loud and messy and necessary democracy, um, Perhaps you've met Andrea. She's up for, you know, she's up for the challenge. She'll be up for the democracy, and, and as she's been saying all along, um, you know, we're, we're strong and we're moving forward and looking forward to being the majority next time when we're next sitting at this table. <laughs> yeah, they're laughing, but I'm not sure they're really laughing. They're not you know? Heckling, yeah, they're not heckling. They're not heckling. Well, I'll, killing with I'll keep a couple <laughs> seats warm on our side of the aisle. You know, when you they listen very respectfully. Uh, Lorraine, how am I doing on time here? Have I, have I got? Okay, good. This will give everybody a minute, basically a minute each, to address this question because I'm always curious about um, the motives why you get in and then what your expectations are for the job once you're in. So please complete, Eleanor, to you first, the following mm. sentence. Wow. My time in public life, however long it lasts, will have been worth it if I manage to... What? If I manage to uh, to make a difference in people's lives, if I manage to um, create a prosperity agenda for Burlington and bring jobs and prosperity to Burlington and enhance the quality of life, and potentially on a broader scale uh, as a parliamentary assistant in my current role, uh, make a difference to the people of Ontario. What's your parliamentary assistantship? I am uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. So you're in charge of? Um, the Come on, I'm, I'm uh, setting you up for the line. No, that's yeah. okay. Not, that's a great line. You know what? Just, yes, I had mentioned Rob to Ferguson you that from the, the Toronto Star, Star drop by the, the other... Ministry of Logs and Frogs. That's he what said. you're in charge great. of now. Yes, that's yeah. what he, he <laughs> joked with me about that. Okay. But uh, a huge mandate in the province, obviously, all of our provincial parks, uh, the wetlands, um, the aggregate files. So it's, it's it's a balance of interest in the ministry. I'm looking forward to it. Granville? Yeah, I, 
I want to make a difference. Here I use that word again. Being a trustee, I worked with young people in various aspects, and I felt I could do this to a greater degree at the provincial level. So that was part of my motivation to run, run provincially. And I, hopefully I can continue to create jobs. In Durham, we have the highest rate of unemployment for young people. I believe it's in excess of 17%, which I find totally unacceptable. So I want to help working with businesses and with our government and reaching out to everybody to try and bring that down. We also have, my riding, I believe, seniors, it's 20%, which is above the average for the entire country, not only the province. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure they have sustainable health care services from PSWs. Gotcha. I'm going to jump in here because I don't want to run out of time for yeah. the re remaining people here. Jennifer, my time will have been worth it if I manage to um, take the voices from Oshawa with me and advance, um, you know, what what they need um, at the doors that was security stability predictability uh, whether it's our unemployed um, youth or underemployed youth mm -hmm. whether it's those who um, are wanting that pension security or job security uh, no more precarious work you know Oshawa has like I said similar needs to the rest of the province but we really need to focus on employment and um, if, if in four years' time that the situation looks very different and people have held me accountable and could come and find me, that I've been accessible and I've, I've actually been useful uh, in making things better, then, I, then I'll be happy. Hmm. Sophie. I'm looking forward to, uh, like everybody else, making a difference in people's lives. Um, I will probably have quite a focus on uh, the various social justice issues in our community. I would like to uh, do whatever I can to strengthen food stability in our communities. Um, look, we're looking at low-income housing. Uh, there are all kinds of issues that have come to my desktop in the past seven years and I'm interested in working on on a provincial level. And I would also like to uh, engage more voters. So mm -hmm. I have uh, reached out to, uh, to school groups, to uh, both elementary school, high school, and to our universities. So those are my main Indira. areas. Improve the lives of uh, the residents of Halton. I want to be able to step away from it all and feel like I've had a positive impact on their lives in some way. It's the fastest growing region in the country. The challenges are there, whether it's transportation, uh, education, building schools as quickly as we can, hospitals, um, and that, you know, also my, my role as a parliamentary assistant in healthcare, wanting to make sure that we are actually taking care of the challenges that people are facing on a daily basis. And I want to especially make a difference to the people of Halton. Diane. It will have been worth it if I can help each and every person who walks through the doors of our constituency office. I want to help as many people as possible. For Kitchener Centre, we have an emerging tech sector. I want to see it grow and flourish. Our manufacturing sector is bouncing back really well, and I want to support that. We campaigned on all-day two-way GO train service to our region, which we are desperate for. I want to serve my premier and ensure prosperity in Ontario. Uh, I'm a PA in research and innovation, and that's a perfect fit for Kitchener Centre, so we'll, I'll be working hard there. And I want to be there to be a strong voice for my riding, as I was as a journalist, now as an MPP. I appreciate all those answers, and believe me, this follow-up question is not meant with a drop, not even a dollop of cynicism. <laughs> but I noticed none of you said, in the lengthy lists of things that you wanted to make sure you achieved before you were done, nobody said, I want to make cabinet. I mean... <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> Blind ambition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well played. I'll well start played, coaching Jennifer. them. There yeah. we go. Uh, that's not so crazy, right? You all want to be in cabinet someday, I assume. Yes, Indira? Uh, I think that this is really about getting uh, a real handle on the job, Steve. So yeah. we're here to make sure that we're delivering the number one job. The job description is being the voice for the people of Halton, being the voice for the people of our riding. If, uh, if, you know, if we are recognized in other ways later on, great. That's the icing on the cake. But that's not why we are here. I don't think anybody at this table ran because they wanted to be in cabinet. I think they ran because they want to be able to help the people in sure. their communities, help but, their neighbors. But you wouldn't say no, right? <laughs> Paul came, you wouldn't say no. 
Someday. We'll see. <laughs> uh, we end this program with the best advice I ever heard any politician ever give rookie MPPs. The advice came from former Premier Dalton McGuinty, who said the best advice he ever got when he was a rookie MPP in 1990 was written on a step, on a sign, on the fr front steps of Queen's Park. And the sign said, watch your step. <laughs> and that's pretty good advice. Pretty good advice. Yeah, Rookies, it's good of all of you to come into our makeshift studio here in Leaside. And um, I know what you're all giving thanks for tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> Welcome to the Ontario pleasure. Legislature. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much, you. everybody. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.